call to order the uh, policy meeting, seeing that all members are available or are here. Um, first order, I'd like to have the agenda. Please. So move. Okay. All in favor? All right. All right. First topic is advertising. In the well, we had no public comments. I'm in the public comments. Sorry. <laughs> no, all right. Thank you. Thank you. This is a picture. Hi. I was going to pass it around for you guys. So it's um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really hoping that what I have to talk about is something that y'all, uh, this is something to do with your committee. I'm still learning what everyone does, so I'm sorry if I say anything that's not relevant. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm Julie. I've got children in the district here. Y'all seen me before. Um, I've been emailing about this these politically progressive signs at the schools. Um, and this is at one of the elementary schools, several of the entrances to the fourth grade classrooms. And um, y'all can see it says, in this classroom, we believe Black Lives Matter, feminism is for everyone, and some other very progressive quotes. And um, I personally, totally believe Black Lives Matter. I think that's a positive saying, but you really can't distinguish that from the, the organization. So we all know if you look at the organization, Black Lives Matter, they have very extreme political views. And I really just don't think that that should be promoted by the school. And I think, um, I just don't know why this is allowed, but not like a conservative type of a sign. Um, and I think, I think the answer would be that if you saw, um, if you saw a, families with progressive views would feel uncomfortable, right? If they saw a sign that was like, go Trump or something, they wouldn't like that to be in the school. Um, just like kind of the, the current things that are there might make someone who has a more, uh, conservative view feel uncomfortable or that their views are not being represented. Um, I also wanted to say that for the past two years, um, parents really haven't been able to come in the buildings very much. They've been closed to parents because of COVID. And I was hoping that now that the restrictions are lifted, that we could maybe come in in the mornings again and just have the teachers, you know, see our faces and have that chance to have an interaction if we need to. Um, and it just kind of feels like, oh, now the parents are, you know, not allowed to come in. So maybe we can put up these signs and it just, it just doesn't look good. It looks like, um, I don't know. It, I don't like the way that that makes parents feel. Anyways. <laughs> um, but going back to those signs, I looked up kind of where that one came from, and it's from a program called Reach Out and Read. And um, I'm sure that they're probably doing some positive things, but when you look at their website, they have some very left-leaning political views. There's a podcast called um, Inner Truth, Crafting LGBTQ Plus Children's Books. And they also take you to a web page on um, healthychildren.org that talks about how two-year-olds can internalize racial bias. So the, over, the overall uh, feeling that I got is that this is just a really left-leaning organization that you have posters up for. Um, can I interrupt you just a second? Yes. I didn't, I guess. The board's okay with that. I know we're supposed to have like three minutes for the talk. I'm sorry, yeah. No, I'm just, I can be. If you're okay, I'm, I'm okay with okay. sending it. Everyone go. But I was just saying in, in closing, um, I think the policy committee was going to look into the legality of these different signs. And I know it might be legal, but is it wise 
um, to have some, there's so much emphasis on inclusion and diversity, but it seems that it's really more one political side that's being included and the other one is not. Um, I was just saying, could we have a sign that said, we value every student equally here, or in this classroom, we respect differences in political views. That would be much more inclusive, I think. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. And then number five, advertising in schools. Uh, thanks, Scott. I have a couple of reasons to think that the policies you see tonight are ones that <clears throat> they're not really following a, a pattern of a series. They're just ones that have had generally on my on my radar for, for a while that as now we have some space to kind of start doing some of our more concerted policy work. I just wanted to bring them up for either timely or their pieces that relate to some pieces of feedback. We so the first one is the advertising in the schools. I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk about. And I apologize it didn't make it to board book, but it was actually the colored piece I handed out to you. And then also the new course proposal um, from the digital um, <clears throat> media course that was approved a few years ago. And the reason I wanted to bring this forward is part of that course proposal that we approved um, was a combination of Jason McConnell's class and um, Mrs. Meinholz's class in the marketing area working together. So the digital class was really the one that was kind of focused on kind of all the advertising, the promos, the pieces that we put up on the scoreboard, um, and when we start to do some of our live streams of some of our events. And as part of that class, and they kind of got two parts, you have the instructional part, and then you kind of have a, a, a piece where some of, the, some of the students get paid for some of that work as they go out and do the video. We're at the point now with that program, which kind of goes into phase two of what was approved by the board, which is now partnering with our sports marketing class and our marketing students. And taking a look at how can we utilize some of the parameters that we have um, within our advertising and sponsorship kind of policies, to be able to allow for our students to then kind of have real life experience going out and kind of procuring some of those pieces um, for our live streams and also for our, um, our onto, the, onto the larger scoreboard feed. So what, what Mr. McConnell has laid out for me, and there'll be more information coming around this, but he outlined those different different streams of, of, of advertising that are possible, things that we currently do. So certainly right now we have certain graphics and commercials and pieces that people have already paid for as we as we purchased into Kind of the, the um, scoreboard, etc. A live stream really has no advertising on it. If you watch any of the other live streams around our, our that our students participate in, they're full of ads. And I think that's an opportunity that we are able to kind of capitalize upon. <clears throat> and then also opportunities through social media, potentially um, things through different branding and signage. That the students could then kind of look through and kind of start to work. And when I talk to Jason about that. This is just their draft concept that they are coming up with. But it's done directly in line with the course that they proposed that we approved. And it's actually kind of been escalated in their in their timing as far as their implementation, mainly because they were kind of pushed into this a little bit quicker with the pandemic. <clears throat> and um, we purchased some additional equipment for them last year. And they're really at a point where they're doing some phenomenal work. And I think as you as I was looking through and talking to Jason, they just um, cleared 70,000 views. You start to look at how many people are actually seeing some of the work that our students are doing. Um, it, it's quite phenomenal. And I think part of what they're looking to do then with the advertising pieces and any of the ads that would be sold is just kind of a concept that we'll have to kind of flush out further as we bring it back to the board and to our specific committee. But part of it was to help make these, these classes self-sustaining. So that as there was equipment that needed to be replaced or to be um, enhanced, but that they had a fund to pull from. And then also some of the pieces that would play into how we deal with other advertising in the district. So this is really just a, a piece to kind of bring forward as kind of an FYI to the board that under this policy, this is kind of where it falls in the policy. It kind of falls into the very last section. This is going to pull the policy up. <clears throat> It just says other situations approved by the superintendent of the board of education. 
our policy needs to be revised in a broader sense for advertising. But for this piece, it really falls under that. That's where the, the caveat within the policy that everything that we've ever done with advertising probably the last five years has fallen under is that everything needs to come back to the board for your kind of review. And that's been everything from Warrior Stadium to the soccer stadium to any other facility enhancement. Things like the Innovation Center, all of those pieces all have come here. So what this is really just doing is bringing back to your attention so we are at a point where that, where that group now for next school year would like to start embarking on some of this work. The marketing students would like to start putting some of their efforts to it yet this last part of the spring. But we wanted to make sure that we were bringing this forward so that we could kind of remind the board that that was part of the proposal for the course. So we're now at that point. And when I spoke with uh, Mr. McConnell on Friday, um, I asked him, I said, I'd really like to kind of vet this out a little bit more and then have some of those more specific pieces come back to the board so we all can see exactly what they're talking about and kind of see the whole scope of that work. So that's something that I'd be definitely interested in doing and we can do in, in the next, um, hopefully, number of weeks. And I wanted to start here with the policy committee because this does fall, even though it's a curriculum program we approved, it does have policy implications and people are just looking at and of how we implement some of the policies. This will be implemented under the special circumstances as approved by the board, and in this case, per that course of approval. So from that perspective, I just wanted to bring it back here and see if there were any questions and what type of things that you would see from your perspective that you'd like to learn from Mr. McConnell and Mr. Weinholz as we brought forward any of these ideas. <clears throat> I guess what are their thoughts potentially on working together? Is it the marketing part of it that would they would, that would, they, that would handle the advertising? They would have what basically I think their concept is is the marketing the students would be kind of going out and helping to market and find some of those contracts or find some of those dollars. And then the um, digital class would then be the one that would actually create the content. So they'd be kind of partnering together. So that's the concept. Trying to have this, this kind of cross curricular area between the English and marketing again. And certainly, some of these things are, are short things. They could be announcements on a PA system. They could be, they could be a, a, of all different kind of nature. And that's really what they're trying to vet out. And that's really what Jason put together in the color diagram at the city of Toronto. So I asked him, I said, you know, many of these things I think would probably generate some questions that we're going to want to talk through. Um, but definitely wanting to um, kind of engage them and the teachers um, with the board and with the administration so we can have a clear understanding of exactly what they're trying to accomplish. So this was our vision for the class was that we could create kind of real world experiences for them, particularly in the marketing world. And then as that digital communications class came forward, it's, it's a very excellent thing. It seems like something that Initially, it started. It's it's pretty innocent, and it's not going to have any kind of conflicts or something. But without thinking it out, through, you're going to have a whole ton of issues that will come up most likely. So I, it's going to take a lot of thought. I think and it's going to take some out. thought through. I mean, this is kind of a high level draft of it. Mm -hmm. But I think right now we're at a point where we 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 do have to bring some of those. I mean, obviously, I think the administration has to be involved. I don't want. But we'll have to look at kind of what that whole process would, would entail as we walk through it. But I think that I think the concept of it was to really start to engage our students and get them closer to some of the actual work that's involved there, having the teacher play a component to it. And certainly we'll have to keep us administratively as part of that process too. So it stays, mm -hmm. it stays tight. And as those pieces would come forward, certainly we'd make sure that from a district perspective that we're covered. So if there's legalities and such, we'd work with the, the students, our legal counsel, et cetera. Um, so it's not just a piece that you kind of give it to the kids and it's you know, free, but it would be a piece that we can bring them closer into the process so that they're actively engaged with it. So basically, this is a very rough draft. It's a very it's rough draft. draft. Yeah, what I had asked Jason to do was put together the concept of what the next steps were, and that's generally what he put together. Yeah. Um, and, and I think All he and Sandra possible. had talked about you know, what this can look like and what the vision is for it. Um, so, but I think there's lots of opportunities here, lots of great things that we can have our kids working on authentic pieces. And I think that that was really the vision that I believe was brought forward and that we, that we were part of our approval at that time. 
How does the booster club, how do they fit into this money business? Um, is that something the different? outside of any booster club. This is okay. just the school district. So. This is just us. Okay. okay. This would be part of us. So. I mean, it certainly has a lot of different opportunities that are better there. And I think you're just seeing a lot of growth in this area. Mm -hmm. Our students have done a phenomenal job with um, all they were, all the work that they've done on those productions. And I think some of that, I credit that with Mr. McConnell kind of leading them through it. Mm -hmm. Lots of, got a huge reach, but it's, it's, it's a piece that started to keep those kind of experiences up uh, and to keep kind of bringing those opportunities to our kids. There are some costs to them, and I think that they realize that they can kind of generate some funds that can help to keep their program moving, keep that piece going forward, and then we can um, work in with them as well. So that was kind of a general concept. <clears throat> but yeah, and I agree with you. There's got to be, it's not just a piece that we can just approve and move on. It's got to, it has to have a quite a bit of involvement. From us yeah, there's there's some guy that is this, uh, but it's definitely a piece that's um, that was part of the concept too, is how to help work through that. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Thanks. Have you looked at the WASD? Do they have anything policy wise? And um, anywhere close to There's it? updates on like this general advertising policies, but nothing that specific that I've seen so far with that student involvement. And like I said, this would be a piece that we'll have to take a look into the a few of those pieces, and we'll have to make sure that any of these type of agreements are, are they're not just. Um, to give by, by, by the students, but a piece that we have an administrative involvement in. And right now, a lot of those types of things like this would probably come through like Mr. May's office, sometimes they come through Steve's office. Um, we've all kind of been involved with them in a different way. But it's more of an FYI that we did approve this, okay. and now we're at the point of moving forward. So as we start to have it, I guess that's a question for, for this committee is that as we bring it forward, is this the right committee? I started here because it deals with advertising. But as far as when we start to put those pieces together and have them present, then I can have them come to the full board. I can have them come to one of our other committees. It can go back to curriculum. It could go back to probably if it's best to the curriculum, it could go to budget because it has dollars, or it could come to the whole board where they kind of present that piece. Yeah, it really ties into both of those. Um, policy and it could be a piece we have them come back do curriculum as a follow-up to their <laughs> just being a curricular course right and then have that make its way back to the board that's a piece we could definitely bring forward yeah that makes sense for everybody so mm -hmm. and as part of that i mean i'm thinking we could kind of lay out a little bit more in detail what that looks like and then secondarily kind of what that process looks like as far as how we feel about it Any other, any other questions? Sounds good. Do we have any questions on that? All right. Go on to the next school property. It's an exciting program. The kids are doing an awesome job. Yeah, they are. Uh, I didn't see any of the, I haven't seen any of the work, but definitely heard it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty quality good. stuff. So. And I, I heard a comment from a recruiter that was doing some work, but that was a second hand, that this is one of the best video jobs that they've seen around the country. As they kind of try to get off, as they kind of watch some of their efforts. So, yeah, it's phenomenal yeah. what the kids are doing. <clears throat> the other, any other questions on that piece? I do have another question with regards to that same policy, though. Um, can we take a look at the, I got a few questions. Can we still, when we look at this policy, this really deals with advertising. And the question that I received from a community member last May. Was with regards to kind of sales. And I think Ted, you and I talked about this when we were preparing for tonight. And what it involved was uh, like, let's just use the example. There's been some of our clubs that have sold things like um, salt for your water softeners. <clears throat> and it's been a program that's been really de developed that's been a partnership with a local business where they um, provide the <clears throat> 50 pound banks of salt. And as a fundraiser, the, the, the students would be selling that as part of the fundraiser. It was part of a booster club, um, school district fundraiser. The question came into with regards to this policy because it says a school district will not be promotion commercial, promoting commercial endeavors. And they viewed it as more of an advertising piece. 
I, I viewed it more as a fundraising piece, similar to like we have vendors for all types of fundraising. There's always a vendor behind it, whether it's if you're selling chocolate, it's the world's finest chocolates, if you're selling pizzas, it's some brand of pizza, um, et cetera. Um, so I looked at it more from that lens. So when I approved the fundraiser, it wasn't approved looking at it as an advertising. It was approved looking at it from the concept of um, we have uh, a sales, we have uh, certain marketing, certain percentages that were coming out of it. And I saw it as a positive looking at the local vendor. <clears throat> but the concern was that it was truly advertising and that we were breaking our policy. If I just shared with the community member, I would bring that back here to see if anybody saw that that was in any way a conflict with our advertising policy. I personally felt it was in line with our fundraising policies, which would which give us latitude to really take a look at. Um, I think the only potential would if, if there were multiple sources for that sort, right. for that, in that case, salt. And there, I mean, how great is it? I think it's a local business that you can actually you know, give them business and it's still it helps us both parties. So I think that's, you know, like you said, any other fundraiser, it's going to that entity, you know, so it would only be a problem, I guess, like I said, if there was multiple ones that have that same possibility and then you, how do you go through the choosing process of that? You put bids out. And, mm -hmm. So that was kind of how I looked at it. That's how I applied it. But I had said when this policy came back up, I would bring it back up. So this is such a way to explain Do we get many other competing companies that want to May or the the candy? Do you have various vendors that compete to help schools? You have basically the way a lot of that fundraising pieces comes and it's is people find kind of a vendor that has a product that they, that they feel you're trying to not have things that you're always selling pizza every single season. So they're trying to make sure that there's, it's kind of broad. So it's looking at different vendors that can provide different products. And I think people are just trying to get creative on, not everybody wants to buy candles and pizza and all those other things. So looking at things that would be um, useful. So that's kind of, I think what you're seeing, at least in the trend here. Um, you see things with like there's wreath sales around the holidays that a few of them do. There's um, but do, is there a, a good percentage of profit made from this? That, that's what they're looking. That's what, looking what they're looking for. What's going to make us the most money? That, that require yeah. us to have a certain percent profit as well. There is stuff like that. Okay, a certain percent. Yeah, 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 I think fifty percent profit out of it. <clears throat> so we do look at all of those pieces, <clears throat> but the question here was solely about particularly like a local vendor is being kind of, are yeah. you promoting a commercial endeavor? Yeah. I felt comfortable with it, but I felt I wanted to bring it to this panel. I think that makes sense. <coughs> so I don't need any action on any of those things. That clarifies my question. And what we will do is I'll bring the, the course work, sports marketing, digital communications piece back to the curriculum. Next issue, school property disposal. All right, school property disposal. This is one Steve and I have taken a look at. Kelsey, this one up here. This is our current policy on school property disposal. And in general, this is an area that Steve works in most closely. I mean, what we really have right now is when we look at property that we are looking to dispose of. For this purpose, what we're talking about tonight is not real estate property, but it's more of um, computers, equipment, tables, those type of things. We have a, a few different options. One is that they can be disposed of and discarded and thrown away. If there's something at the end of use and doesn't have value to it, there's items that we recycle. And there's items that we put up on the state auction to sell. So the conversation that I've had with Steve is just wanting to kind of revisit kind of what our practices are when we have disposable property. Because I think right now what our two defaults are is we go to the recycle route and we and we discern to some level what we're going to put up on the state auction. And I thought it was just a good conversation piece. And, and as part of that, 
Um, I also looked up and see what type of revised policies we have. So we have them just starting to work in the area of the um, property the policy resource guide from the school boards association. So we utilize that to pull up a few different options of this of disposition of district property. And what I've utilizing him, I asked Steve to take a look at it for me. Go back here. Because this just kind of walks through you know, what are some of the things that you want to be looking at when you are reviewing disposing the property. One of the things that we would we would argue is that like updating our policy makes sense, but we would keep it within the business office and I would not give authority to dispose of the property to our building principles. I think it's important for us to kind of have a district-wide vision of that. I think it's a piece having kind of one department or one person who can kind of oversee that and help to guide that process as opposed to it getting outside of that. But the general concept that, that I want us to at least be kind of thinking about is how do we dispose of the property that we have? Some of the things and are there opportunities where we can bring in some additional income for the district as opposed to just paying to recycle. So in some instances, we have items like Chromebooks, we have items like an iPad that come to an end of life for us. If they don't, the Chromebook has, I believe, I think four years before the software will not update anymore to coordinate with the, with the networks that we needed to talk to. A lot of districts out there that have Chromebooks, the, the, the marketplace is pretty flooded with people selling them. So there's not a huge market there. But there could be a market where these some of these, these items could be utilized where we could sell them locally. So just wanting to be thinking about are there some items such as that that we could put up and sell them back to families and sell them back to some folks who could utilize them personally without us just utilizing them as kind of a recycled item that, that we kind of work the way through. That's just a simple example. We have other ones that we could kind of be talking about. But from our perspective, when we looked at kind of property disposal, I just wanted to kind of revisit that issue. And I thought while we're doing that, we should revisit what the policy looks like. So Steve, you took a look a little bit at the policy for me. You just add a few of your thoughts to that. Uh, sure, thank you, Andy. Uh, we primarily use Wisconsin public surplus auction site, which is what most forms of government use. It can be really hit and miss. You know, we can sell things on there and there may not be a lot of interest and items that you would expect would sell for a better price don't. And then there's other times where items do sell uh, based on demand. Uh, so we use that site almost exclusively just to make sure everyone has the same chance. So we do get asked from sometimes staff members, sometimes community members, you know, where do you sell your items and to make sure that everyone has the same chance to buy them. We just put them out there publicly for everyone to see. Sometimes that works in our best interest, sometimes it doesn't, but it always is viewed as a very fair approach to take because it's publicly available. And I think that's why a lot of forms of government use that website, just because it takes out of the equation any concern from someone believing a particular group had access to old equipment and someone else did it. But it is always worthy of taking a, a closer look. There are some forms of government doing things like selling technology on eBay. We haven't done that. Uh, but that's an approach that could be taken. There are some forms of government who would hold a community-wide, uh, call it a garage sale, right? So you have your Chromebooks in the back of Bethel Circle. You have them back there. You advertise it to the community. Instead of auctioning off, you say, use Chromebooks, $20 a piece. So there's different strategies that we could look at as far as disposing of property. Fundamentally, we've used the auction process. In looking at this policy from uh, the sample policy, I agree with Randy in that we don't want to put our principals in a position of trying to have to decide also themselves how to get rid of the property in their building. 
it makes more sense to coordinate it district wide. And there have been plenty of times where one building was deciding to dispose of something that we found another building that wanted it. So it's, it is a good process, we believe, to manage centrally. I do think these policies are, I would prefer the one that's shorter as opposed to the one that's longer. You can see how short our policy is right now. Uh, the three pager is a little bit more brief. The, the longer one has quite a bit more details to it. Uh, so one thing that we're looking for feedback on, because obviously what you see on the screen in front of you is a more decentralized approach where property is disposed of based on the building or the apartment. Uh, so we're looking for feedback on that because that's contrary to what we do right now. And then the second thing that we'd be looking for feedback from this committee on is page two has several places where you insert the dollar amount. And it's important to understand uh, as board members, what do you believe that threshold should be at which we make the decision that we are going to make items available to the public through whatever means we choose. So you can see it says, the per item estimated resale value in excess of blank is listed there. So there's some position, there's some, some dollar amounts that would go into this. Whereas board members, you would be authorizing administration to move forward with sales based on set thresholds. Our current policy does have dollar amounts in it and there's different approaches we would take. Uh, but just keep in mind, um, if an item is currently determined to have no value at all, we handle it differently than an item, let, let's say through an auction. Uh, but just keep in mind that this policy has blanks in there that we need to fill in. So if you have any feedback, we certainly could do that. I would suggest we might look at a per item resale value of maybe $25. Uh, certainly if we have a hundred of something that makes it worth doing, uh, but you don't want to sell a single item that might be worth you know, $30. Uh, so there's got to be some dollar amount where you decide what's worth the administrative costs of creating a sale and selling something. Uh, and Do so, we have to know that ahead of time? I mean, we generally can tell you know, by looking at resale what something might be worth and get an idea. Uh, Technology is pretty easy to tell. Uh, other items like music equipment is a little bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, we do trade in as well. This policy does reference trade in. Sometimes that's the best dollar value. We Are we get. talking furniture here too? Yep. Yep. It could be old furniture, it could be tables, it could be at some point. I'm not sure we need 600 of those white tables we used for lunch. I mean, that could be a piece that we would decide that we would use. But that's kind of the concept we started talking about. So mm -hmm. I guess what we're looking at from the committee tonight is just any, any first of all, just uh, feedback. We, we believe it should probably stay centralized as opposed to what this sample policy, which can't be centralized. So I think still keeping it with the business management part and then having us kind of go back and look at revisiting some of these dollar amounts. But the concept behind it is just wanting to kind of open up the dialogue of being more open to how we dispose of some of our pieces and trying to make sure that we can, where possible, we can provide some things potentially to our community at, at a lower cost as opposed to them going and hitting a larger auction site. Or other. It doesn't mean we won't still use the auction site because they're extremely efficient. Um, but if there's opportunities that we can do some things differently, just wanting to bring it to the committee to and open up that discussion. And when do you throw in how much it costs to organize this to get rid of it? You know, right. you've got that balance. Is this worth you do. the effort of going through? And that's part of why the so, auction site is very nice. So there's yeah. some of this that we have to kind of look at. It may not change our practice as much, Judy, but at least I think it's worthy of out. the discussion. And well, I like the centralized yeah. place. Generally, where it is right now, it sits with Steve right now, and that's where I'd probably keep it. But I think right now, the dollar amounts that we have in there are just one marker of $5,000. There's a few things that can bring it down a little bit better that maybe are worth looking at. 
can you be the one determining if it has no value? I do partner with our staff on that. Like as an example, the music staff will help me understand if something has value. So like they'll approach and approach me and say, we have these five you know, pieces of equipment. I will engage in a discussion with them. And so uh, depending on the particular equipment, I ask the staff members to help me I'll make that analysis. I mean, where, where I'd be going with it is, okay, if it hits that threshold and you determine it has no value, it's like, oh, great, can you just give it to me? It's like, I'm sure it would still have to go to make it the general population aware that this is available now. Right, and that's why we've always used that public auction site, because if someone yeah. says, oh, I would, I would take that, well, then I always say, I can't just do that, or I've got to make it available to the entire community. And you can, if you win it with a dollar bid, fine. But then everyone has a chance yeah, at it. Yeah. So I, I always make sure that if anyone wants something, it goes through that public auction site. That's what we currently do. Yeah, so nothing goes where it's just given away. Right. That's the piece that we've been pretty strict with. It's just trying to open it up and probably modernize this policy, but it also bring it back some things that we kind of in a different place that just to kind of brings everybody's attention to how we're that way. Particularly as we look at furniture, referendum type things, or maybe things that we want to dispose of that just give us opportunities to manage those to the best of our ability. Can we go back to one of your examples you were talking about like Chromebooks and their relatively low resale value. Um, so if we did start going down this road more. Is that something where you would put it to like, you know, if people in the community want to come get it, we're going to do this on a certain day or a certain way at X amount per combo. Okay. Then what about the concept of taking some of those things that are actually can still have educational value, providing them for free to people who follow within the free reduced lunch program, for example? I mean, I think that's something we should consider that if we can help families with educational resources that we're finding we can't use on a large scale basis anymore, but individual families that can't afford to just run out and buy a laptop for their kid, this would be something we could do. I'm just saying we should consider that sure. as an able. Yeah, that's not a current factor in this policy, but that makes sense to, to consider factoring that in. We just need to have a way to state what is that level and who would qualify and that sounds to be an easy program. And maybe that's a piece of even work through the committee, the financial assistance committee or something to see if speaking out loud. It's also sort of a it's a sale as it is, you know, because right. I mean the reason you're getting rid of it's because they're not you're not going to be able to update it anyway. So right. they won't either yeah. right. to a degree. Yeah. If many of those things will work for a bit longer they just want to sync with some of the things that we have. That's really why I'm bringing this, this forward. So, I guess what I'd like from the committee tonight is just the feedback that have Steve and I go back and kind of keep this centralized and kind of put some additional thought to some of those dollar amounts, and then we'll bring that back and with the feedback we've had, and we can think about the training this one. That's good, right? Yep. 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 Thank you. Uh, next one's on discuss and consider guidelines for elected officials and schools and related events. Um, this is an item that's not in board, but so I apologize. It was when it took me a little bit longer to get pulled together. And the whole concept that are behind this, this has been on my Kind of on my radar for a number of years, just from a respect as far as wanting to have some guidelines that drive some of the things that we do within the schools, particularly as you start to look at um, different elected officials or legislative folks who come in and visit our, our students, um, things around uh, the, kind of the, some of the political activity that sometimes school district, administration, board gets pulled into. And then also just looking at um, some of the things with our students that we've done in the past that I just wanted to make sure that we're, we're, we're in line with. So this could be something when I talked to Dan Mellon at the School Board Association, he said, 
This could be a policy, it could simply be a district guide or under the district guide. But the concept of it is, is that we do welcome in, our, in our, for, for, for my purposes tonight, I use the word elected officials. And it probably could also be looked at as public officials or for other folks who maybe aren't in an elected position at the point at the time. But that we, we, we value those, those individuals coming in, they provide opportunities for our students to learn about civics lessons, insight into governmental processes, current events, and other issues in front of our legislative body. I think that's why we have some of our elected officials come in, because primarily this happens at the high school, um, but it can happen in other places across the district. Some of the guidelines that, that we've kind of brainstormed through are with regards to having a clear and concise kind of purpose for the visit that has a curricular reason. Um, it's appropriate for the age of students. It's not partisan, it's not campaigning, so it's not someone coming in to campaign and we're providing more of an advocacy. Teachers should be able to look at them um, regardless of what political affiliation it is and looking at just the merits in front of, of them coming forward. One suggestion Dan had was you may want to provide an opt out for parents if, it's not, if somebody did not want to participate in an activity like that. And then obviously, I'd have it as an approval of the administrator. So, just some basic guidelines that if you're a teacher, you should feel comfortable inviting folks in and kind of wanting to follow those guidelines as you do so. There's also times when we invite in elected officials for ceremonial purposes. So, examples that we've done is when we open a new building or at some sort of a special event or when they've come to present awards. We've had teachers receive Teacher of the Year awards. We've had different types of awards that people have been a part of. And just wanted to articulate that those are those are very acceptable pieces that we're excited to celebrate. <clears throat> Looking at a little bit of protection for our students that if somebody is there, that, that they're in caution as far as any sort of photography that would be used with students. And then also two items that I thought were at least I wanted to bring up for discussion. One was in the past, we've had nonpartisan groups like the League of Women Voters come in and work with our high school seniors to help them get registered to vote. If that was something that they were interested in. They usually did it during lunch. I'm talking to Brian Borowski. They usually were up to date, um, partnered with one of our student groups, either the uh, Young Conservatives or the uh, you know, progressives, I forget the name of that. Yeah. So they've partnered with some of those in the past to kind of create an opportunity where um, the kids who are 18 in the first year of voting could register to vote and learn more about that process. And the last item I had here was just a piece that, that from my perspective, I just think is is, is something that we should be, we should consider is um, we've been asked once or twice in the past, I think I've turned them down and this have occurred. For like legislators to come in and have like bill signing within our district. We're pretty close to Madison, we're pretty close to being tied to that, but not everybody in our community often agrees about all of the different things that get signed. And that if those are things that people want to attend, either board administration staff off site, that's kind of on them individually, but not hosting them during the school day and school stuff. So this was just kind of a really kind of a random piece of, of, of different pieces that I felt over time. We should at least discuss and provide some guidance to so that there's fewer questions if we as these things occur. So with that, I'm really wide open for suggestions from it, whether you like it, you don't like it, if you like it as a guideline or you like it as a policy. Do we have anything that fits in with armed service recruiting? Does that that's a whole other topic. That's a whole different. That's a and whole then, different policy. And that's not in the schools? Yeah, that, that falls Judy with regards to. If we allow um, college recruiters in, we have to allow by, by federal law the uh, uh, military recruiters in. So that's already covered. That's okay, right let's go. So that this is this is this is just things that are things. Generally, these are all things we pretty much think we have done, mm -hmm. but there's not been any guidelines to it. And I just want to felt that there should be some guidelines that at least provide some parameters to it. Um, do we have any problem with nonpartisan entities? Who decides they're nonpartisan? <laughs> it's a million dollar question for us. And the group we've worked with in the past has been the League of Women Voters. And I think that they worked with the high school and they were tied in with them, one of our student groups. I worked with Brian on that and he felt that the best partnerships there when we do something like a voter registration is having it tied into our student groups and then have them work with the group. But yeah, it would be something you would want definitely. It's 
I wouldn't want it to be the Republican Party or the Democratic Party potentially, but if there's another group that's more nonpartisan, I think that's not there to promote one piece, but to promote kind of good civics. That's kind of the concept of it. Yeah. We've done this a few different times. And probably in the last, I think it's mainly not some of the larger election cycles, but definitely it, it has occurred at our high school, but we've never had any guidelines for it. Okay. I think my only question kind of relates in two bullets that yeah. if this if this person is coming to speak on a clear articulate curricular purpose, yeah. like for example, let's say you brought in somebody from the elections board come in and talk about how elections run in Wisconsin and that and it's directly in the curriculum of a government class right and then you give the option to opt out is a student opting out because they don't like current office holders or whatever but they're missing part of the school curriculum the class curriculum right. that to me that strikes me as well you could opt out of a a section of Black History Month because you don't like that, but then that material is on the test. Right. That's one I, I don't necessarily see if I feel, if I feel strongly about that piece, but it is I, I agree with opting out like an award or a recognition that maybe that student or family does not feel is appropriate or doesn't want to participate because of who's handing out the award. But if it's directly, if we're going to put in the thing of direct curricular purpose, okay. I have a problem with opting out of curriculum classes. If we're having a required for well, it goes back to the previous point. What determines the political nature? That's what it. That's right. what it's going to go up to. Right now. I mean, it's going to have. You know, it's it's like if you, you brought in your assembly person, regardless of political affiliation, to talk about and then what's going. How does the legislative process work? Mm -hmm. The concept there is it should be tied into something you're doing in the curriculum. Right. If you're bringing in somebody from one of our federal offices, regardless of affiliation. They shouldn't be in there talking about the positional piece of that, but talking about how does this work and what are some of the issues that are in front of legislative bodies at the time that are being debated. I mean, those are pieces that I've seen of being extremely productive. You know, the opt-out piece was was just a piece that was it was pulled from a few different pieces of language. That was one that was in there because some folks have felt like, well, if it's of one party affiliation or another, do you do you give that as an option? From a curricular standpoint, I think that's the vetting piece. I don't necessarily think that that needs to necessarily be there. And as far as awards, I mean, when you have uh, large awards that we've received, I mean, that our, some of our staff have received, those are represented, but right? those are presented usually at those school assemblies. Yeah. But to me, that's really not one of the that people opt out of the celebration of a student or a teacher's kind of recognition. Well, and to date, but to Dave's point, if it's part of the curriculum, that's not the only venue for that information to be given to have a speaker. It must be somewhere else in the curriculum that the kid could read about it. Uh, if that's the only way they're going to get it, it shouldn't be, I don't think it should be part of the curriculum. It should be an augmentation to that, right? Possibly. But if you're going to have opting out on parts of the curriculum, whether it's a speaker or a book or a text or a, 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 a film that's being shown to the whole class or whatever, if it's part of the curriculum, opening up that door of saying you get to opt out of parts of the curriculum you don't like. But when I think for this purpose, we're talking about speakers coming in that are augmenting our curriculum. And that's why I think you can you can opt out and it's not a big deal. We do have a policy on um, so line up perfectly here. We do have a policy on controversial issues in the classroom, of which there's pre-notice and then there's opt-out ability for certain things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's generally where this line came from was from that line of thinking. Yeah. There's not a lot of policy on this out there. So when, when, when I was working with Dan now from the school board association, he gave us a few things to think about, of which I added to them a different narrative here. But that was the concept. Mm -hmm. So right. really, in a way, they'd be able to opt out down line. Right. So don't, don't we have an opt out for growth and human development? That's by state law. That yeah. is yeah. right. And so, but is that part of the curriculum? I mean, do they get it elsewhere if they, where they opt out of the whole class? 
for the whole unit. No, yeah, student human growth and development has an opt out provision that's by state law, but it's not necessarily then caught up in another part of the curriculum. Really comes down to the content that they're talking about. I guess I don't care who's talking, or that shouldn't that shouldn't matter, but it's when they push the lines of the content that they all they're they're doing it. That's where we're going to get into an issue. Yeah. But that's where all the other bullet points are about. Right. Yeah. I mean, these, these things happen now. We have people come in and speak with our kids. And I just thought, you know, we should have something that gives some guidance to it. But if you're going to come in, you need to provide just kind of the parameters of what you're talking about so that it stays within those lines. And we can provide this to somebody to, to give them those kind of guidance. I think we need guidelines just to, to support teachers so they have a they feel safe in what they're doing. Otherwise, right. you'd be jump looking over your shoulder every time. So like there's like three different pieces here. There's the one about kind of speakers, there's one about photography. Um, piece is kind of close because it's I think that's with anybody who lives in our school. Really, but it's just kind of articulates it. There's the other one with regards to kind of the Registering the bullet type piece, and the third part is just about kind of bill signing, which yeah. we don't get a lot of, but you do get on the paper. So, on any of those, are there any things that you do you like it as a as a kind of a guideline that we administratively use, or do you like this as something that you'd like to see more as a kind of a policy? I like the guideline. I think that's more flexible. You get a policy, and then you got to vote it in or vote it out. And I think it, it, it's a lower level when it's a guideline. And I don't think we've got necessarily anything right now. And I, I think the guideline gives us a chance to see what's going to happen, how is this going to flesh out instead of us trying to think of every potential bad thing that could happen. Could be a guideline that goes into a handbook to encourage the change and approve when the ones have the ability to speak, it's easier to change. Yeah, right. and then, and then I, I just feel like the teachers need support from administration and the board that this is a possibility. It's not a I agree with the guideline idea. I think it's a little more flexible. I mean, this is such it could be such a gray area. You're going to need some flexibility to deal with it in a reasonable manner. The vast majority of bullet points are great. The, the photography is definitely important. And making sure that we don't take some of the nonpartisan stuff and turn it partisan, such as just registering kids to vote. Ready to the Board of Education to approve the My question is, where will this be located so a teacher would know they should go there? Or is every single person that is invited to speak in any class, does that all run through the principal of that building? Is he aware of or is she aware of every single person that might be? Yeah, that would be a, so let me answer both those questions. I mean, that's kind of the question of guideline versus policy, John. Where would you find it? So if it's a policy, it obviously ends up on our website as a policy. If it's a guideline, I'd probably make sure that it goes into one or both of our handbooks. So I probably like our student handbook. There's some level that would go in there that talks about kind of guidelines for some of the curriculum pieces. So that'd be a piece that we'd have to kind of vet and see where that falls. So that, that's a question that I'd probably take back and kind of have some further discussion on as far as how we would make that better. Work. But there's a few options for that. The benefit, as Judy said, about a guideline is you can more flexibly shift it if there's something that comes up. Um, if it goes into a policy, it obviously has a more formalized process to come to the board. I'm, I'm honestly okay with either one. I just felt there should be something here that gives us a little bit of more parameters particularly as we start to kind of walk through some of these and there's questions about these as they come forward. So do you think like uh, the high school principal would know in every person that is invited in? To every well, class? That's, that, that's a piece that you're going to have. No, do I believe that happens? No, absolutely not. So you're going to have to have some level of a conversation about yeah. as you have guest visitors that kind of fall within this parameter 
But that's the same thing, whether it's a policy or it's a guideline, you're going to have to have that level of dialogue. You need a motion or you just I will the guideline. You'd like to go with the I mean, if, it, if it's something you'd like us to explore as a guideline, it's waiting to bring it to the board to share it just conceptually. We can talk about it there and we can make the motion to move it to the board to kind of have the discussion of do you like this as a policy or a guideline and we can decide where that goes. Even if it's a guideline, we can still improve it as a guideline and then we, we can move it forward. I guess I'd like to just keep it here. Yeah, okay. try to work on the guideline, bring it back. All right. Here. Are there things in here you'd like to tweak? Is there anything that's specific? I can figure out what I can bring back is kind of where the guideline is going. That yeah. is the biggest question. I, like I, don't, I, I don't think anything specific. Okay. So you just kind of want some additional clarification of it as a guideline. Kind of going down the guideline path. Yeah. And it gets down to what Joan's question is how do you disseminate it out in order to go? That's unfair. Thank you. My other question is to add to that. Uh, one of the I used I didn't like the word politician, so I used the word elected official. I like that too. Um, but the other word that I've also thought about is I probably should add in there other public figures because some people aren't always elected. They may be previously elected or be in some other capacity, so it might allow for people. Um, is our it, might be, it might be running for election though, so they're still they're not correct. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I also thought I don't want to kind of negate anything with the school board. Because you're elected official, but yeah. I don't but I see that as you operating differently than you're certainly not getting in the park. Well, we had a, a, we had a and, visit from Hillary Clinton when she was the president's wife. Now where would she fit? She's not public. elected, but she's a public. She'd be a public. That's why I think I need to add the word public figure. Here public well. figure. Yeah, I think that would be. Official and public figure. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I'll, we'll bring this back with kind of some guide of where it was going as a guideline. Appreciate your feedback. All right. So Next we'll issue transportation in areas of unusual hazard. All right, this idea. This is one that's very pertinent for us in the work that we're doing right now. In respect to bring it forward. That's, that's the wrong computer to show up. This is really addressing is our transportation of students as we determine where hazardous areas are in our community. So we've done this at a few different different points in time. Some of this is goes back probably predates you, Steve, which is when we started to work with the sheriff's department to determine where we're not safe, where were areas that were hazardous for us to have kids cross and walk to school, particularly when they're underneath the the mileage markers for our gut for our transportation policy. And then also taking a look at this as we have things change within our community. I think you spoke to me the other day, Steve, about you know, how we put together a plan when our even school was built and just articulated where areas we have for, for hazardous areas of crossing and the road. We don't have currently have a policy on this. And I felt that this was something that we, we ought to do. And when Steve and I took a look at it, um, we would actually end the policy here on page two. This is kind of an editor's note that's optional. This was from the School Board Association. We felt that what we should be doing is keeping this area from here, from the first page, from half of the second page. But staying out of this whole kind of the weeds of the administrative process here, mainly for the reasons that they put in their editor's notes. But this is an item that's timely for us because as we go into our referendum planning, and particularly after we 
have a approved plan, hopefully after November, it will then, I think, spark us to want to go down this process to kind of review where our hazardous areas are in the community and also start to take a look at how that then impacts just how our community has changed over the years. Mm -hmm. So from a, from a perspective of, of practice, I think we should have a policy. I think it should just be that first page and a half that gives us a, ge a general guidance. And it's not something that I would implement for next school year. I would wait till after the referendum for us then to kind of discuss as a, as a board how we then move forward with this. And part of this is, is certainly has a lot of process to it. Some of it is outlined within state statute. Some of it involves the pieces of working in, in conjunction with our local sheriff's department. And part of it includes us having a plan that we develop or we, we develop within consultation with those. But the general concept of this is that we, we don't have a policy here that helps us identify what those processes are for identifying hazardous areas. And we feel we should have a process that should have a policy on it. And it's something we should do probably in the next several months so that we have it as we come out of the rest of it. Steve, this is kind of more year round. Anything to add to that? Sure, just a couple of comments here. I mean, so we do have a lot of parents who contact us every year about transportation. And we have to take a look at new subdivisions when they're being developed to try to evaluate, do we believe there potentially could be a connection to uh, unusually hazardous areas. So recent examples would be the Arboretum Village subdivision. So we did get some calls we needed to evaluate the walking paths basically from the neighborhood to Arboretum. Another example would be Heritage Hills and the students that are walking the prairie. So we do look at this when new developments occur. We also look at this there in state law, there's an ability for parents to file an appeal. So there, there is a lot of process in state law regarding this, but the community's also changed a lot since the core hazardous transportation plan was put in place. As an example, there's now push button crosswalking systems in place that didn't exist before. We have more crossing guards than we had before. And at some point in time, a review of this topic would be appropriate, but it definitely should be done in conjunction with potential referendum plans and or elementary school attendance boundary changes. You definitely don't want to do those things separately, which is to Randy's point about making sure we get through that planning process first. You all saw on the presentation from Mark Roffers that Arboretum Elementary School was going to be the first school that had a true capacity issue with the three elementary schools, with the construction of homes in the vicinity within a walking distance of the school. Unless we look at the attendance boundaries, we're gonna have students who could walk to school, getting on a bus, going to a different school, while kids are being bused in. So in the near future, we will have to look at this anyway, we'll have to look at it depending on how the referendum plan shakes out. So it just makes sense to do. It does not make sense to do for this fall, but if we could get a policy in place, we would have that framework to work from and parents would have a better document to reference. Uh, we have like a single statement in our transportation policy about this. This would be a better way for a parent to understand how this works. And as Randy commented, we do think from the editor's note down, that's more of an administrative process. Uh, and typically our board policies are shorter in nature. You certainly could have this be longer, but I think from the blue note <coughs> above is a really well-written policy and provides information to our parents so they'd understand this process. So is our policy defining what our hazardous areas are, or in, in theory, not identifying them in town, but in theory, we're making a policy, if you have to cross a busy street or whatever, then 
this is considered a hazard. Yeah, that's exactly right, Judy. If you go up just a little bit, Randy, you see those bullet points there? That's yeah. really in theory. That's exactly what you just said, Judy. That's in theory as to what could make an area become an unusual hazard. And as an example, there's a bullet point, the presence or absence of crossing guards. That's an important factor, right? So we have crossing guards at locations that have been defined as unusually hazardous. Probably does not make sense, right? To do both, but we are doing. And that's just a lot of history over many years and changes that have taken place in the community. So the bullet points really guide the process and we can point to that to help the parent understand it's a combination of factors. It's not just one, right? It's not the sole determinant isn't a crossing guard, but that is a factor. So is the speed limit. So is the ability to have a clearly defined walkway there's a variety of them. And so as a board, you would be indicating, these are the criteria that we are planning to use in our community to help determine when this applies. And are we? Are you asking us to give more criteria? You could comment on the criteria, like as an example, if you think some of them are not appropriate, we could take them out. Uh, those are generally the ones that are recommended for consideration, but, they have to fit our community. So you could look at something and suggest a revision, modification. Uh, that's why we've got this in front of you. So you can have a chance to look at it, give us your feedback. I almost think more than anything else, this helps define for parents what this process looks like because state law gives a parent the ability to appeal. But if they were trying to figure this out from our policies, it's very difficult. So I think what Randy's bringing forward is a more transparent process for our parents to understand what does this look like. The last time we talked about this was probably 2013-14, right around the time of the last referendum. At that point, and it was determined to really kind of stay status quo with where we were. And I guess given the level of growth we've had community-wise, we're back into another referendum and we have phases of things that we're looking at, which probably makes sense. One, I think we should have a policy on it that at least articulates what this is. As Steve said, it's only like one line in the handbook. And this is dictated by state law. And it is a piece I think we should at least have in front of us, particularly for consideration after we get past the referendum. So. Brian. Yeah, so how do you, I see temporary, you know, we have a lot of construction going on in this town on all sides. So if we knew that was a five month project, do we give transportation for the whole year from that, in that neighborhood or how would we handle those short term situations? Yeah, great question. So we have not granted unusually hazardous conditions for a construction project. So that would be new to us. And, and the other thing I forgot to mention is once the process is completed, a student that might be, let's say, less than one mile away from a school, we can now report that student to the Department of Public Instruction for transportation aid. That's one of the main reasons the state has a defined process is you cannot report a student for transportation aid if you don't have one of these plans in place and they live less than two miles away from a school. So there is a small financial component to it, uh, but for Brian's question, it is notated in here as one of the things, a factor to consider. It's not something we've done here before. Like, it's not a concern, but one thing that might open it up is well, you could hear that again. I live in a neighborhood that's building 40 houses this year, and I don't trust the stuff, so I want my kid to be picked up someplace. So, and I think those are some of the things we have to talk to. I mean, right now, I, I don't this is on here for us to really kind of see as the committee. I, 
I would recommend we do have a policy on this. I think it makes complete sense. So what Steve and I can do here is take any feedback you have from there, and we would bring back then a draft of this. I mean, this is again, this is, is a is a sample policy from the school board association. Some of it's pulled right from state law. So we'll go through and make sure that it lines up, see what lines up with that and what doesn't. And then we can kind of make some recommendations to the committee um, at, at, at a future meeting. The, the timeline for this, and this is something I'd like to get on our books, but it's something that I wouldn't look at for implementation until we get post referendum. Is any feedback tonight? We'd be happy, happy to take it. Otherwise, it'll be a piece that we would recommend that we take back and we kind of put some, you know, put together a, a more formalized draft to even look at tonight with more conceptual conversation to kind of bring this here, similar to how we did in 2013. This time, at least get the policy points that have been. Agreed. Okay with that part. I don't need a motion. No, I don't think I need a motion on that. I think that gives us the direction. I mean, I can put that together for you. Request to eliminate policy for today. This should be a pretty easy one. Um, the high school administration contacted me with regards to um, this is a junior. Junior senior um, responsibility release. So they're able to leave school when they don't have a class. They're able to do so with certain parameters of state law. What the administration was looking at was that in actual policy, because that's what they were looking at, there's their form and they don't use this form. So one of the things we've done over time is as there's kind of been more of an administrative form that associates with the policy, we just eliminate the form. So that gives us more flexibility. This is an electronic form now they use with students. It's very similar, but I don't think it necessarily perfectly reflects what's being utilized and it probably doesn't need to be in policy. So our request is just for the exhibit to be removed from policy. And that's just now becomes kind of an administrative form that we use as, as students have form. This is actually something that's driven by a policy that's still in line with our state law. So it doesn't change anything for that kind of practice standpoint. So I recommend we remove this form. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The other things that we have for future meetings, um, one is is exactly the kind of the piece that we had some public comments on here tonight, which was with regards to speech in schools. School Board Association is looking at a, a sample policy around that. We've had that question from other districts. So that'll be a piece we can always bring back here for some discussion. The next item is there's a when you go back a year and a half and we started this whole process of reviewing policy, we did some work with the School Board Association on Series 100. We've already finished those. 200, we, we approved last month. They also did something called a quick look, a quick check, where they went through and looked at policies more broadly across all of our books. And I do have recommendations, at least for policies that we should be kind of working through right now. So that'll be a piece Rebecca has organized those. And that'll be a piece that I'll start working through over time and we'll start to see them filter through here. And then the next piece from that um, is with regards to our next series of policies. We'll probably start with either the three or 400 series. And that's that'd be after few, the quick look policies? It'll, it'll, it'll probably be in conjunction okay. with that. Judy, I'd like to kind of keep these things moving. I have some work to do with um, some pieces to be specifically with them. Um, and now at the School Board Association, I'd like them to kind of go do like we did before, where you had a review of our policies at that series, give us some recommendations. We now um, are part of the policy resource guide. So we will be able to use that to kind of pull and utilize some of those more effectively. So that's kind of our next steps. This committee will be relatively busy kind of moving forward. Um, it's quite a bit of, of work to do, but it's, it is one of our, our goals to kind of work through the policies. So we'll, we'll keep at it. 
So my thought is that if we are at the end here, we could um, set a future meeting time, and I would recommend we. Would. It could be something maybe about a week after spring break that would allow us to get some of these things completed and then move those in front of the that get them in front of the board and make it April. So last week of March. Yeah. Now we do have a community engagement meeting tentatively scheduled for Monday the 23rd. That was our last one. So we'll talk about that at the March meeting. Theoretically, could be something before that. That's at like I believe six o'clock, um, or we could just pick another night that way. Well, I'm open on the 28th. Yeah, I'd stick with that same day. Did you say stick with that? I'll stick with that. Yeah. Yeah, commit one night. That same day. Yeah, I'm saying yeah. doing it before the community Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. So what time are you looking at? Um, oh, that 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 work? Work? That work? What's the pencil of input so we're on it? Were we? Oh, we, I didn't write that in. Well, we didn't write it. We we're supposed to try it. Oh, well, something should be in the five o'clock on the 28th. What was the time? Five o'clock. Okay. So I think that's it. I think that's all we have. Take a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? All right. All right.